Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome back to our online service at St. Thomas Baptist Church this Easter Sunday. And I hope uh, that in your time that you've most likely been spending at home today, that you've had a great day, um, however different it looks to previous Easter Sundays. As a church, we are all about the resurrection of Jesus. Um, through it, he defeated death and sin and has brought us new life. And what we want to do this evening is explore what that new life in Christ looks like. Um, and we're going to do that by asking a few people from our church, from our church family, uh, their stories of, of how they came to know Jesus and also what a difference Jesus has made in their lives since that day. You'll be pleased to know that in the Bible, the uh, act of giving your story, giving your testimony of how Jesus has affected your life is, is a real theme. Uh, one of the most wonderful encounters happens in Acts 26, where Paul is standing before Agrippa on trial. And he just tells him his story. He just tells him of how he was on the road to Damascus. He used to be a Jew who would work his way towards favor with God. But then he had an encounter with Jesus. And then he realized it was through grace that one was saved. And at the end of Paul giving his story, that simple act of giving his story, Agrippa actually turns to him and says, do you think, Paul, that in such a short time you can persuade me to become a Christian? And the reason he says that is because there is something immensely persuasive, um, immensely interesting about someone giving their stories of how they became Christians. No matter how exciting or dull you might think yours is, the act of someone coming to know Jesus is a miracle in and of itself. And I hope uh, this evening you will enjoy the stories that we're going to be looking at. Before we start, I'm going to pray that God will direct this evening and help us to enjoy being together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this Easter Sunday, and we thank you that the story did not end at the resurrection. The story began at the resurrection. And now we uh, enjoy new life in you, and we look at the Bible and we see the wonderful new life that the early believers enjoyed and the the, the necessity for them to just share this message with others. And Lord, we thank you that all of us, if we're Christians, have a story. Uh, we have a, a narrative of how we first encountered you. And I thank you that that is precious. It is a miracle. And I pray this evening that as we hear of some of these stories, you will stir our hearts, encourage us, and help us to enjoy uh, the togetherness that we will share through them as well. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The first uh, story, the first testimony we're going to hear is from Jeff and Rita. And um, before I show you the conversation that I had with them, um, let me encourage you to, to take time during this evening, pause after one of the testimonies, have a think about it, um, have a pray about it if you feel like that's what you'd like to do. Um, but use, use each break as an opportunity to think. So now I'm going to hand over to the conversation that I had with Jeff and Rita. Hello, Jeff and Rita. Welcome. Hi, John. Hi, John. Hello. Thank you so, so much for being with us this afternoon. And thank you for, for just spending time talking to me and talking to the church about Jesus and, and the difference that he makes um, in your lives. The first question I have for you both, and you can answer it independently or go wherever, is you're both Christians. You both come to St. Thomas Baptist Church. You've been coming to us for a, a fair few months now. Um, was church a big part of your lives growing up? Um, how did that work? Were you taken to church or, or not? How, how was that for you both? Well, I'll, I'll answer first, if that's all right. Um, I was brought up in Coventry and I lived there for the first 18 years of my life. And my parents, even though I never remember them going to church, they encouraged me to go to Sunday school from mm. right far back as I can remember. So I went to Sunday school and, and then went to confirmation classes and attended the youth group there until I, I left Coventry and, and went to study away. The other question I had, and then I'll, I'll ask you the same two questions, Rita, as well, is, is did you, in, did, was that fun for you, Jeff? Did you enjoy going or, or how, yeah, what did you feel about that? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed going, actually. And then, then once I got into teenage years, I had lots of friends there and, and that sort of thing but then I um in later years I think I was converted when I was 13 but then I um I sort of drifted 
away from later on, but yeah. I um I remember that I used to go to Coventry Godiva Harriers on Sunday morning and I'd leave church very early, so I'd be shooting out of the morning service. So mm. I uh, I didn't attend so so um religiously if you like. Yeah, yeah. No, I understand. I got into later teenage years. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, how, how did that look for you, Rita, growing up with, with church? Yeah, I was brought up in, uh, in Ireland and mm. everybody went to church. I mean, it was just something everybody did at that time. And I don't remember ever disliking going. Um, although when I was, until I was about eight or nine, it was Latin. So I didn't understand it, but I loved uh, singing, which was in English. And um, yeah, I enjoyed going and uh, our life at home was also quite religious. We would say the rosary night. Um, so my father would lead the prayers and we would all kneel down okay. and um, answer those prayers, uh, or say the second part of the prayer. So they were quite repetitive uh, and I think I felt quite sincere about it all. I think at one time I even thought about being a nun. So I think um, until I left Ireland, I went, uh, I always went to church and it was very much part of our lives. And that was when I was 14 when we left Ireland. So, and then I did continue going to mass after that. Okay. Yeah. Great. So it sounds like you, you both had a lot of experience with church growing up, um, although slightly different with, with one in Coventry and one in Ireland, um, by the sounds of things. Uh, so with that in mind, at what point um, in your life, so both of you did, did going to church, did this um, experience of, of being involved in church, what point did that change from being something you just did as a part of your family to, to something you started to, to really believe as an individual? Well, I, I think I, I always believed. Um, I, I remember at primary school, we had these little books about uh, stories from the Bible, and, and I, I believe all of those. And in fact, I went to confirmation classes when I was into secondary school. Mm. And at the age of about 13, we were going through confirmation classes, and, and it struck me at, at that point that Jesus died for my sin. He took the punishment that we deserve. Mm. It didn't all sink in. But I remember reading a book called Journey into Life and, and committing my life to Jesus at that point. But uh, so I think that's when I actually became a Christian. But then in later years, I, I drifted away mm. and didn't come till, till later. Uh, but I still called myself a Christian. Mm. and still read the bible but not as avidly as as i might have done yeah no i understand that and and at, at what point what, at what point in your life did you start to become more serious about about faith again was there like a, a catalyst that that led to that yeah well i, I met rita and uh i told her i was christian mm. uh, you know as we got to know each other but um I wasn't able to really explain. I was very woolly and I couldn't explain what the fundamentals were very well. Yeah. So uh, I drifted on and then um, we, we went to live in the Sudan okay. uh, when I was 29. This was in 1980, what, 82? Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, 1982, wow. before you were born. Oh yeah, and, quite a bit, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, she, we were in Sudan for three years, and then towards the end, there was a big famine erupted in, in Ethiopia, mm. and I spread into uh, Sudan and across into Chad as well. So we saw lots of refugees coming into our area. And some Christian uh, charities came to do work, most notably World Vision. And so with them came people giving aid, and... Um, a couple of Christians started coming to this little meeting in a local church, which was a minority, because remembering it's a, a largely Arabic, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, Muslim area. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, we had a, a little church meeting on the Friday afternoon, which is a sort of day off. And uh, it was then that I started being drawn back, I think. And then not long after that, we came back to the UK and Mr. Banger. 
where I was working mm. and uh, started going to eventually an evangelical church and the the sermons and the Bible really started speaking to me and, and it's there I really feel I came back and uh, so I was I converted at 13 mm. but brought to God at 33 and we wow. were baptized in Bangor Wimpool together oh, wow. uh, in 1987 yeah yeah Oh my goodness, okay. When I was about 33, 34, yeah. something yeah. like that. That's amazing. It's, it's just fascinating to hear the, that it took a, a while for that to happen, that you, you had an encounter with Jesus at such a young age, but yeah, God brought you further and deeper into that relationship as, as time went on. Um, That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and how, how did that look for you, Rita? Obviously, Jeff's given us a bit of a, an idea as to, to what your lives look like, but leaving Ireland at 14 at, at what point did the Christianity did um, Jesus become well, reality for you? if I could just go back a little bit because um was growing up in Ireland I mm. always um well I had a real strong sense that I was I don't know I'd have said I'm a sinner but that I knew I wasn't good that I, I never felt I was good, even though I wasn't a particularly naughty child or anything. Mm, mm. But I all remember somebody saying to my mom, I was helping my mom the house, and her friend said, you've got a really good girl there. And I remember mm. thinking, and I must have been very young, I'm not good if you only knew me. And I don't know why, but I think I had a really strong sense of what I now know to be sin. Mm. And that that was in some ways quite crippling in a way, because... I never really, I mean, I'm thankful in that I was brought up to know about God and to have uh, always believed in God, always. I never had any problem believing there was an all-powerful God. Mm. Um, but hearing about sin and having that sense of sin without really hearing about the uh, remedy for that, mm. I think, was a problem. At one time in my life when I was about when I was 13 I think it was that my mother had was going through a very bad mental breakdown mm. and my father had died uh, two years before that and I started talking to God but actually talking to God Mm. And I had never done that before, and I just did it on my own. And at that time, I really felt God helped me to get through that time of my life. Mm. But I didn't really understand how that happened or why that happened. I just knew that God was helping me. And I can look back on it now and see that I most certainly was. It's, it was a very, very difficult time. Mm. When I... I then, I never, I can't say I ever for, for, forsook God, but I did go through a time of living my life for me mm. and not, um, not for God. And, but never being really happy. And there was always something there niggling that was not right. And you put, I pushed it away, pushed it away. And when mm. I met Jeff, he was the first person I met who really read his Bible. Mm. and who said he was a Christian. And I used to talk to him about what that meant. And to me, it meant be good. And I remember saying to him, I can't be good. I can't be good at the time. I just can't do that. Mm. And although Jeff understood, I think that that wasn't it, I don't think he was able at that time to really explain what it was. Mm. And... Um, so therefore I thought God would never accept because I'll never be good enough. And that comes from, I think, wrong thinking and teaching about God. Mm. And then it was, um, it was much later. Um, and I, I went through times as well of feeling angry, angry with people who talked about sin. And it was mainly because I knew very much about my sin. Mm. And I remember hearing an air preacher preaching and think, how dare you tell us about our sin? And, mm. You know, I felt very judged, but it was because I knew there was sin and yeah. I was trying to push it away. Sorry, this is quite long. No, please keep going. This <laughs> anyway, is fascinating. Um, yeah. As, as time went on, um, I 
always had that sense of sin, always. I can't say that I ever thought I was good, and mm. I wasn't, <laughs> but I had that sense of it. And to fast forward, in when we went to Sudan, um, I, I always knew Jeff was different, even though he would say he was living as a, as a Christian, and he wasn't in many ways. Mm. But there was something about him, his integrity, or something that I found very attractive, and mm drew me to the way he lived so he was an example even though anyways he wasn't living flawed. as a christian a yeah. flawed one yeah. yeah um and so um we went to sudan with a two-year-old child and we're both into sort of just adventure and didn't think twice about going there was no sense of does god want us to do this there was nothing mm. like that but it was while we were there and really towards the end of our three years there that Jeff really got involved with this um, small fellowship. Mm. And at the same time, and I can only say that God was doing because I still can't remember at what point, but I started reading my Bible. And mm. that unlike when I tried to read it before, I, where I would start in Genesis, I was reading Matthew's Gospel. Mm. And every time I read it, it was really speaking to me. And I, st I was starting to see a God who was different to my image of the God. You know, I, I, it was a God I didn't know. And mm. I'd had my own image of God. And I could feel God really drawing me. And it was just spirit because I can't remember making any decision. This is what I'm going to do. It was mm. something God did to me. Wow. I'm reminded of in the Bible when... Paul goes to preach to the women in Philippi and there's Lydia there and it says the Lord opened her heart and that's a, a verse that I that's what God does mm. he opens your heart it's not something you work up to mm. he does yeah. it and that's what I can say he did and but by the time I started going to the same little fellowship Jeff asked me one week to go and I said yes I'd like to go mm. and I realized that when these people prayed, they they were praying to God they knew. They were praying to somebody that was they had a relationship with. And I wanted that. I really wanted that. But I felt I didn't have it. Mm. There was not the unity. Jeff had the unity then, but I didn't. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, at the same time, I don't think I still fully understood the cross. And the significance of Jesus being in my place or anything mm. like that, that took quite a while more. But it did happen. And when we came back from Sudan, I said to Jeff, I really want to go to a church. <laughs> and we went to a charismatic church mm. in which Jeff, Jeff felt very comfortable, but I didn't. And I, I felt, no, this is not for me. I felt uncomfortable. And I don't know why, but just reading my Bible... Uh, we were pregnant with our second child, which was a big surprise because well, the Rita was pregnant. I was, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We were um, which was a big surprise because um, our, there's nearly six years between our first and second child. Okay. And so we came back to an unknown, an unknown, no job, no no house, uh, expecting expecting our second child. But mm. God had really made me feel. Don't worry. I was mm. reading Matthew's Bible and the verse, do not worry about your life, mm. really spoke to me. And I was really trusting that somehow God has told me that he's got it in hand. I don't know what's mm. going to happen. And it's funny, I, I was thinking about this because I, I, I felt quite at peace about it. Not, I wasn't thinking God's sort this out, but mm. I, I felt at peace and, and not panicking. I, don't, I mm. didn't understand why. Mm -hmm. but you, you were worried yeah I had been worried thinking you know what are we going to do and where are we going to live and yeah. and then I read that that verse in Matthew's gospel and it just spoke a real peace into my heart mm. and I so I knew that I was starting to trust God and when we came back we eventually when our second child was born she was very ill caught whooping cough at 10 years old and okay. it was quite critical for a time and uh, so I, I didn't go out. It was a very cold winter. Our first child who can cough as well. And, and it was a difficult time. So Jeff actually continued at that church, the Pentecostal, but I wasn't going. Mm. 
Mm. But at the same time, I was really um, talking to God and starting to develop a relationship with God. But I still had a real sense of my sin and that I had no peace about that. And it wasn't until we started attending an evangelical church a few months later that I really started hearing God speaking to me in every sermon. Mm. And I used to want to run out. I used to feel like this guy knows my heart is yeah. reaching. I didn't think it was so much God as the guy knows what, what's mm. in my heart. And I used to want to run out and not anybody speak to me. Mm. And, and then I started being a real year of being given. And it was terrible. I have to say that that was terrible. And all I was doing was asking God to forgive me. To mm. forgive me, but I wasn't feeling forgiven. Okay. And anyway, I spoke to our minister at it because it was beginning to just really make me so crippled. It was like crippling. Yeah. And um and so I didn't doubt by this time I had a much better understanding of the cross. I didn't doubt that God could forgive me, but I still didn't feel like I was forgiven. Mm. And so I, I spoke to my minister and he, he sa I said, I feel terrible. I don't pray for anybody else. I don't pray for anything else. All I'm asking is for God to give me. Mm. And he said, I remember him saying, you will not be able to pray effectively for anyone else until you know you are forgiven. Yeah. So I thought, and he told me to go away and read Romans. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I went away and read Romans and thought nothing happened. Mm. So I thought, okay, I'll read it again. And I read it again. And it was, and, and then I went to a third thing. And I remember it was one morning, um, I was upstairs reading it, and I got to Romans 6.23, where it says, the wage of sin is death. Well, I knew that. Yeah. <laughs> it was heavy on me, I knew it. But then, but, but the gift of God is eternal. And it was like God was saying to me, I am offering you a gift and you're not taking it. Yeah. Because there must have been still something in me that felt it had to be something I did. Yeah. And it was at that point that I felt this overwhelm. I cried my eyes out and ran down death and said, I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven. God has given it to me. And, yeah. and that's when... A burden was lifted and a void was filled because mm. I, that void that I think I'd always felt as long as I could remember as, as a child was, was filled. And that was God. God did it all. And he did it because he's the one who does it. By yeah. grace, you are saved through faith. And this is not of yourself. It is a gift of God. And that gift was something I just wasn't taking. Yeah. That must have been an incredible release after all those years to have felt absolutely. such a weight of sin and then understand the gift of grace. Wow. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It sounds like that, that few years living in Africa really like set off this amazing journey for you both in a sense of, of really rediscovering and discovering, yeah, grace for you, Rita, and just a depth of relationship for you as well. Well, uh, what Jeff. was funny was the, the fact that we were both being moved at the same time. Mm. And that, that was a miracle in itself. Yeah. We, we felt the same sort of things that God was actually moving us, yeah. you know, to, to know him and to, to follow him. And yeah. the, the church that, uh, in which we started going to that evangelical church at that time was just what we needed because mm. it was straight from the Bible. And there were, there was, you know, in all its truth. And, and um, we both felt Jeff had been into liberal theology in lots of ways and mm -hmm. had, you know, some mixed up views. And it was, it was, they were all dealt with mm -hmm. the preaching of God's word. And that is why that's important. Mm -hmm. But the big difference for me was understanding that I no longer had to think about my religion Mm. but to think about my relationship with god yeah that's the yeah. important thing yeah. absolutely yeah that's a it just makes a massive difference and I, I think yeah i've spoken to lots of people about it a journey that's similar not not over such a long period of time but a similar journey where they're left thinking that christianity and church is a religion instead of a, a god that they can know and actually really enjoy having a relationship with um, yeah. wow that's great that's such that's just really exciting um 
for to be on such a great journey. um, Yeah. 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 But I have to say that there are times when I've drifted away from God, Mm. you know, not, not by stopping going to church. I've always continued going to church. I've even always continued reading my book, but where I'm not following, Mm. but I, God has always drawn back. And I believe God doesn't let any of his people continue to do that. Mm. He'll bring you, he will bring it back and he will hold to you, to you. That's what I've found Mm. over the last few years. Mm. we've been through a difficult few years um mm. jeff and maybe like to talk about that a bit about how god works in those situations yeah when i was going through a difficult period more recently mm. um when i was um back up in uh, cardiff where we moved after 20 years in Bangor. okay we moved down to cardiff and we were there for 12 years yeah um because of redundancy yeah mm. because of redundancy in in Bangor. Okay. which was one of the worst things that had happened to me at, up to that point. Mm. Um, so that was a real shock to the system. But my faith, Jesus still held me fast. And so this, this elder church sent me uh, the hymn, He Will Hold Me Fast, mm. which we sung at, uh, at uh, our church here, yeah. haven't we? Um, yeah, so recently... Uh, over the past four years, I've had lots of medical issues, and then we've had some personal issues with, mm. with the family as well. Um, so I had open heart, um, heart, open heart surgery four years ago. And then uh, a year later, I had a stroke. And then they found, when they looked in my brain, that the, it wasn't just a stroke, but there was a brain tumour there. And so okay. they operated on that uh, in 2017 and and then I had radiotherapy and chemotherapy subsequently but um, even in those times really it was particularly at those times that I felt God close mm. and I remember after the heart surgery I'd, I'd come out of intensive care and Rita had been visiting with me in the ward and then she went home and I was feeling quite afraid you know, I think I was probably fearing death, but mm. um, I had been reading Mark uh, chapter five and, and six, and, and particularly looking at the the gathering, the, the Jesus going to heal the, mm. um, the possessed man, and that's one of my favourite episodes in the Bible. But then he comes back across the lake of Galilee. And he's met there by Jairus, one of the mm. synagogue rulers. And uh, his daughter is dangerously ill. And in fact, on the way there, they, they're told he's died. And Jesus to them, him and his wife, don't be afraid, just believe. Mm. And that, when, that, when I was going to sleep, it's almost as if, as if Jesus stood there and said that to me. Don't be afraid, just leave. And that really calmed me down and, and helped me an awful lot. Um, and then we've had lots of trouble since, but then we, we because of family matters, we had to move down to, well, we, we felt we should move down to Exeter mm. to be near our daughter and two, two of our grandchildren. So um, we would, I'd had chemotherapy up to uh, January last year. And we, we actually uh, put an offer on a house and were due to move in, in May. Mm. But the, the lady selling the house, for some reason, just pulled out. And it was really dismaying. We was, didn't know what to do. But we had to just... Because had sold. Yeah, the house had sold. So uh, we had okay. to keep well, on looking at the house. Yeah. And then um, uh, in the end, we, we found this house and, and very near to church. and. Uh, put the perfect house for us in many ways and mm. we realized that in that God was in that because as it turns out I, I wasn't well enough to move down in the May but okay. by the July I was well and um, so we really God's hand in that but in all these things he's been a source of peace despite all the trouble going around and now I've known at the bottom of things that he is there Jesus Christ is my not just my saviour but my Lord as well. Mm. He's mm. in control of everything. 
Yeah, and I would reiterate that, that um, when Jeff was ill, people used to say to me, oh, it must be so worrying. And I didn't want to seem like I wasn't concerned about my husband. Mm. But I used to say to people, actually, I don't feel worried. And I knew that wasn't me because if I really sat down rationally, I would worry. But it was, God didn't let me worry. And he just let, helped me to, to trust him. And he mm. did it again. It wasn't, I'm not naturally somebody who thinks, oh, no, it's fine. Yeah. It was just that God, God, it was like, I got it. I've mm. got it. Uh, and the verse, he is able. Mm. He is able to do immeasurably more. And just yeah. those three words, he is able, came into my mind an awful lot. He is able. And yeah. it was so, it, a peace giving three words to me so often, you know, mm. if I started thinking about something or he is able. And it, it's, yeah, it confirms difficult times, confirm um, God's faithfulness. Uh, of which sometimes we can lose sight. Mm. And um, I think it, it's the difficult times that he reminds us I, that he is faithful. And sometimes that's the time when we're driven and he brings us back because mm. he's faithful and mm. won't let us continue in, in sin mm. um, or to worry or to feel that he's not, he doesn't care mm. um, because he cares about everything, absolutely everything. Mm. That's just incredibly encouraging, yeah, to, to know that the faith that God gave you and instilled in both of you um, to have such a, yeah, seemingly hard few years um, in so many different ways that, yeah, you're still able to rely on him and, and still able to, like, know the truth of, of who he is. And, yeah, those three words, you're right, it's just incredibly powerful that he is able. And I guess just seeing as, yeah, this is Easter as well, just to know that you can have so much faith and so much confidence that God is in control of life and death because, because of the resurrection of Jesus, um, that he's able to overcome and, and completely destroy death once and for all. And I think that's the thing that um, I often, when I'm discussing this people and talking about, you know, life and sometimes people will say, why does God allow this? And of course we know God um, is not the one doing it. Mm. Um, he allows it, but he's not the one doing the awful things. And this world is full of um, terrible things. And if I wasn't a Christian, I don't think I would want to live in this world. Mm. I honestly don't think it because there's so much injustice by the way human beings treat each other and the way that we ravage God's world and mm. all those things. I think if that's going to continue forever, I don't want to be here. Knowing that Jesus is coming back and is going to restore all things is such a wonderful thing. And that is not going to continue. Mm. Um, but also knowing that people still have opportunity to come to him. Mm. Um, and that, you know, is that he, he, he offers eternal life uh, and, and a heaven where things will be as he intended them to be. Mm. Um, perfect. And I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to being uh, with God, to seeing him mm. and to living, uh, being able to live for him without the sin, without the struggles, um, but particularly without the sin, being mm. able to pray him without that hindrance. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's an incredible thing to look forward to. And I think you're right. That would, that would dramatically change my perception. Well, it has because I'm a Christian too. You'll be glad to know. But it d drastically <laughs> changes the perception of this world with the knowledge that yeah this is not all there is and we will worship god face to face one day well thank you thank you so so much for for sharing both and giving us like a picture of of your lives um both before you're married and, and after you're married and just showing us how how god has impacted those and and i'm sure like yeah people will find that incredibly encouraging to to see the effects that it's had um on your life so thank you thank you very much for, for joining us Hope you enjoyed that conversation that I had with Jeff and Rita. As I mentioned, you can pause the video now and have a think or have a pray. Uh, but now we're going to move on to the conversation that I had with Ellie, who's one of our students at St. Thomas. Hello, Ellie. 
Hi, Tom. Hello. Um, thank you so much for being with us on, on Easter Sunday. And as you know, from what I've said to you, we're basically just spending time with people who are Christians um, for however long they've been Christians, just trying to explore um, really what the resurrection means to them, what Jesus means to them. So really, really appreciate you spending time with us today. Okay. Um, so you're one of our students and you've been with us for like three years now. Um, have you had a good time at St. Thomas? Everything's been okay? Yeah, it's been great. I don't regret the decision to come to St. Thomas at all. Well, that's always a bonus. So I'm pleased. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so in terms of like your, your Christian faith and the way you've um, become a Christian, all of those things, I guess one of the first questions to ask would be, um, was church a big part of your life growing up? Were you taken to church uh, as, a, as a child? How, how did that work? Um, so when I was a baby, my parents dedicated me, um, which basically means that they're committed to taking me to church um, every Sunday as much as they can and um, encouraging me to find Jesus for myself. So I was taken to church throughout the whole of my childhood um, and I attended a lot of youth groups um, that the church put on um, and Sunday school and everything like that. And what, did you enjoy being a part of church growing up or was it a bit of a drag? What was your feelings about that? Um, yeah, I really enjoyed church growing up. I had good friends um, in church. There was only a few of us, but we're still really close friends now. Um, and I enjoyed the services. Um, I went to Great Parks Chapel growing up and they're really focused on it being a family church. So they made services um, catered to that as much as possible. So yeah, I really enjoyed it. Nice. That's cool. At what point did going to church become like less of a thing you did and more of a like a way to express and explore your relationship with God? Um, to answer that question, I think I'm going to have to say how I became a Christian. That's great. Um, so when I was five, after like a holiday club at church, um, I asked my mum to say a prayer with me before bed to become a Christian. Um, okay. Like I didn't fully conceive of what it meant for God to like give up his son for me um, and have a relationship with me but I knew that I wanted to follow him so going to church when I was younger was it was being a Christian um, or like that's not the right way of saying it but um, it was because I wanted to know Jesus but I didn't fully understand what Jesus had done for me until I was a bit older mm. um, but there was never a moment where I I suddenly started going to church and fully understood it was like a really gradual process. Yeah. Um, and I wasn't baptized until I was 16. So yeah, a really gradual process for me. Mm. No, I, yeah, I understand that. That's often, often the case of people that grow up within church. I think that kind of just a gradual understanding that, that grows over time. Um, so you, you said you got baptized at, at 16. Um, what, what was it? about being at that age like what was happening when you were around your teenage years that, that led you to be baptized at 16 as opposed to like 12 were you in a different place with with God how did that work so in school I was always I always told my friends that I was a Christian but it was very face value because I would say I was a Christian and then I would like kind of not behave like one and I would do the wrong things and in year 10 that really became apparent in my life so I was doing things that I knew were wrong and um, I think it was it was at camp that year that I was really convicted of I'm saying to my friends that I'm a Christian but I'm not living like one and that's just really wrong of me um, and I felt guilty about it because I wanted them to become Christians as well but I wasn't behaving like one and it was at camp in 2015 that God convicted me to get baptized I think somebody might have spoke about baptism and I just really felt strongly um, one evening that I should um, and it was then that I would say my life really changed and I was very dedicated to following Jesus and I definitely wanted to leave my old life behind mm. that's really cool yeah so was it like it sounds like you began to realize that following Jesus um, was something that requires like everything um, yeah for sure yeah yeah, yeah. And so obviously you're not 16 now, I, I don't think, because you study at uni. So, <laughs> um, but what, what has that been like since you became a Christian? Is it, has it been straightforward? Like, how has that been? 
Um, so the year after I got baptised is probably one of the hardest years, actually, um, which is funny, really, because you wouldn't think it would be like that. But I had a lot chucked at me, a lot of trials um, okay. that I think matured me a lot. And then coming to uni, um, I think all of those things have prepared me really well for uni because when you go to uni, um, you actually have the opportunity to decide that you want to become a Christian and live for Jesus of your own accord, rather than it being very much attached to your parents or home life yeah. and home church. So um, I think that, I don't remember what your question was, but I think I might have answered it. I'm not I, think, sure. I think you have, yeah. The, the question was really, and you did, you said that the year, the question was, how has it been since you became a Christian? Has it, has it been straightforward? Yeah. Um, it sounds like correct me if I'm wrong, the, the year after you got baptised was hard and there were yeah. lots of trials, but yeah. you found going to university quite helpful in being known as an yeah. individual. Yeah. yeah. No, I'd agree with that from, from personal experience, actually, that there's, yeah, you don't want to leave home because home's great, but um, yeah, there's something quite freeing in being known as, a, as an individual as opposed to so-and-so's yeah. daughter or son um, sure, within a yeah. church. Um, that's awesome. So, the question, I guess, rounding back, it, it, you've given us a really good understanding of, of your life and that you grew up in church and it became real over a gradual period of time and, and that you've made a real dedication to make Jesus, you know, not just your saviour, but also your Lord at the age of 16. Mm-hmm. Um, what difference, um, what difference does Jesus make to your life? We're celebrating Easter Sunday, as I said, and celebrating the resurrection. How, how does the resurrection make a difference to you? Yeah, so um, for me, it's just amazing to know that Jesus, the creator of the universe, um, he is the like the beginning and the end, wants to know me and have a relationship with me. Um, a lot of people, when I speak to them who aren't Christians, often say, like, if there is a God, I don't understand why he would want to have a relationship with me because I'm so insignificant in comparison to him. But mm-hmm. For me it's just so amazing to know that he does love me and want a relationship with me and I can really see that in my life in the sense that I've, I've had anxiety since I was a teenager mm. so I really struggle with um things like this I suppose mm. yeah, yeah. And like them talking to people um and things that put me out of my comfort zone really um and God has very much like opened me out of my shell and enabled me to become more confident and he's also been a rock for me during struggling with anxiety um so yeah I think that yeah no I I agree totally yeah as someone who who's had similar struggles in the past there's something quite freeing and and like liberating about knowing that God is in control even though like you can't be in control of everything and you might be anxious but yeah that's it's just yeah I just agree with everything you're saying really really ardently because <laughs> yeah which I guess is good <laughs> but, um, yeah thank you that's really cool really really encouraging to hear the the tangible difference that 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 makes and to know that that this God who's in control is not like this distant God but like a very personal one mm-hmm. um, must make a huge difference at uni there's a lot of opportunities to share the gospel with people through the ECU so in my first year I was kind of involved in Act 17 and mm-hmm. in my second year I was a whole group leader mm. um, and that really put me out of my comfort zone but obviously you weigh it up against the fact that you're sharing the good news with people and that's so more important than you feeling anxious about something and God can give you the ability to feel confident in those situations so that's something that's really helped me Mm. yeah that's it yeah uni just gives the best opportunities for that to to suddenly yeah have to make the decision as to whether you're going to really stand up and and share the gospel with people and tell people about jesus um yeah because it it's it's a nerve-wracking thing to do i guess isn't it those kind of things yeah it is (laughs) in terms of like the past like 12 months especially has there been anything that that God has particularly um helped you with or you've been really like amazed by him doing in your life yeah so that's a good question because it's recently that um God has really shown me what he's trying to tell me in my life so Mm. um I would say in the last 12 months I haven't been feeling close to God but I've wanted to um so 
I think a lot of that was because um, I was in this really bad mindset that when I sin, mm. um, I was guilty about it. And I wasn't really fully appreciating the fact that when I say sorry, God has completely forgiven what I've done and he's um, forgotten about it. Mm. And I was still holding on to that guilt and thinking I'm not good enough which is really sinful of me um and throughout the last 12 months I've really been trying to take things in my own stride and like not putting my trust fully in God so um things like for the wedding and um buying a house and everything that's really been um I've seen it in, not in my own strength but I haven't really fully trusted God with it I've still kept parts of it in my own hands um um, because of um, everything that's happened and all the uncertainty with coronavirus, um, mm. we have, Josh and I have fully had to put our trust in God and we don't know whether we'll be able to get married on the 26th of June now, um, mm. but that's okay with us. I mean, it's really heartbreaking when we kind of found out that we might not be able to, um, but we both agree that we're happy that God has put us through this trial because we can really see... Um, that we both love God more and that isn't because of us that's because of Christ working in us and um, we just both find that really extraordinary so yeah yeah that's that's incredible to hear um the way that God's used that situation and yeah I think if you didn't have God in your life if you weren't a Christian it would be so easy to, to just become really despondent when something yeah. like that happens mm, for sure um, yeah but knowing that God's used that to bring you close to him is is really cool yeah exactly yeah yeah i often find that it's so easy as as humans to like have been christians for a while and then just forget that actually we we have never been able to bring anything to the table like uh, us mm-hmm. at our strongest we're just still so so weak yeah. um and actually that's what the gospel is really in order to to accept jesus you have to accept that you need help yeah um, and he he chooses people that are weak and works in their weaknesses which mm. is really yeah that's like a pattern throughout the bible isn't it just like yeah weak it's like weak central just loads of weak people just being used by god and doing incredible things so yeah oh wow that's really really encouraging to hear that's great um so with that in mind um the the last question i've just been asking people is is do you have like a particular verse or passage in the bible that that you in your life have, have found to be particularly encouraging yeah so um i have quite a few but i have narrowed it down to one okay um, well done it's isaiah 52 verse 7 and it's um how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news you proclaim peace you bring good tidings and you proclaim salvation you say to zion your god reigns Mm. um i really like it just because god brings us good news um Mm it's it's jesus's feet that are running on the mountains to bring us good news from god so i find that really amazing yeah that's awesome and for that to be an isaiah as well uh, like before jesus even shows up on the scene yeah um i i watched a bible project video a few months ago on on the theme of messiah and what the messiah is and they they mentioned that the reason people's feet were like no i mean all those years ago people's feet were like if you were a messenger they'd be really bloody because you would have been running and you wouldn't have had like shoes or you would have had sandals and they'd be really dirty and nasty and that finds its fulfillment you're right in jesus who on the cross his feet are bloody and awful because he's got a nail through them yeah, um cool. so like yeah how how beautiful are yeah how good are the feet that bring yeah. good news absolutely and um also another thing that when I read it the second time because I'd always shared your interpretation of it when I read it but I was thinking that also like our feet are going to be bloody Mm. from this race because um like being a Christian isn't easy I mean I've tried to share some of the hard parts in my testimony but um again like being a Christian is suffering with Jesus and what he did on the cross for us and if we think that becoming a Christian is going to be easy then it's not at all Mm. yeah yeah that's I never really thought that we're also in that camp you're right and at the very least if we're going to be trying to share the message as far as we can then our feet are probably going to become quite sore at some point so (laughs) yeah 
Oh, thank you. That's really cool. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much for sharing with us. That's okay. Well, happy Easter, everybody. <laughs> yes, happy Easter. Easter day. <laughs> wow. After I caught up with Ellie, I had a chat with Richard about his story and how he encountered Jesus at quite a young age, uh, but that set him on quite a journey. Let's have a look at the conversation we had with him earlier. Well, hello, Richard. Thank you for, hello. Thank you for being with us. Um, um, I guess the first question would be, growing up, um, was church, was Jesus a, a big deal for you in, in, in your life? How, how did that work? Um, my parents have always taken me and my brother and sister along to church um, <clears throat> since we were born, really. So I um, kind of grew up at St. Thomas Baptist Church, going to Sunday schools and um, <clears throat> kind of kids groups, things like that. So for, for me and you know, the family church was just a, a normal way of life. Um, you know, I didn't really know anything, you know, I didn't know not going to church. Um, so yeah, so church was very normal, um, being taught from the Bible, praying, because it's just a kind of normal, normal thing that, you know, we did and, you know, it's part of, part of our life. Um, so, you know, was, a, so in, in that being normal was, did you enjoy being a part of the church? It sounds like you were quite involved. I mean, yeah, from, um, you know, being really young in the church, going to like, um, Sunday schools and stuff like that. That was good fun. I had friends in the church. Um, I was part of the Boys Brigade. That was really exciting. We did loads of cool stuff um, from that. And so going to church was an enjoyable thing. It wasn't uh, mundane. It wasn't boring. Um, didn't have to be dragged to church. I kind of yeah, enjoyed going. The, the activities were, were good fun. So um, yeah, I enjoyed, enjoyed that aspect of it, yeah. And, and at what point... Um, so I suppose you, you've grown up in church, you've, you've had a reasonably good time. Uh, at what point did, did church or, or Jesus or religion, I suppose, your, your, your encounters with church, at what point did those change from kind of your parents taking you to, to you thinking yourself that this is something that is worth being involved in? Was there like a certain age? Um, I remember um, probably the first time that I thought about it kind of from my my point of view my opinion what i thought about kind of what i was being taught at church um was probably around the age of eight um i was at a it was um something that was happening at church um there was a guy called richard hubbard he came to the church he was doing some some kids work doing some uh, music and songs and stuff and um he was just again explaining about jesus who jesus was what he had done for us and you know how we could respond to Jesus and it was then that I made the decision around the age of eight to um to ask Jesus into my life yeah. and so what what was it about Jesus that that made you think I want this guy to be a part of my life was what what were you what were you told that that really I guess brought you to that place what was it I think back back then at the age of eight was probably the under having a a basic understanding of Jesus had taken my place. Mm. Um, I was aware that I had done things that had hurt God, mm. but other than God punishing me for those things, because God loved me, he punished his son in my place. Uh, Jesus willingly took what I deserved um, and gave me what I shouldn't have had back, you know, eternal life. Mm. Um, so it was a, a basic understanding that Jesus had out of love had done something and taken something that I should have received mm. punishment in, and um, given me life uh, instead of instead of punishment of sin so it's just a, a basic understanding of, of that and you know what Jesus has done for me yeah it's, yeah it sounds like it's yeah very much like understanding for the first time that you need to respond to Jesus being your savior and almost like yeah saying saying that prayer and and asking god to to come into your life and yeah I'm, I'm sure that there are loads of christians who probably had a very similar experience at a very similar age as well um but yeah that's i guess that's encouraging that you know being a part of the church you were able to to hear the gospel and respond to the gospel yourself at, at such a young age so in terms of 
trying to answer the big question of kind of what the resurrection means to people and, and what Jesus means to people really and, and what he did. Um, is that something that you, you like took throughout your whole life or have, have you had times where you've kind of been hotter than others? Like, I guess what I'm trying to ask is, has, has it been straightforward for you in terms of your Christian walk? Has, has Jesus always been like the number one person in your life? No, certainly not. Um, I think, especially kind of in my, probably my later teenage years and early 20s, mm. um, I always had a belief in God and I knew what I believed to be true. Mm-hmm. The impact that that then had on how I lived my life um, wasn't what it should be. So, you know, um, the way I lived my life kind of through my late teens and early 20s wouldn't have reflected um, what I believed as a Christian. Mm. Um, if you saw the way um, yeah, I behaved kind of that kind of in that time of my life, you wouldn't have said, oh yeah, he believes in Jesus, that kind of thing. Um, you know, so although I still believed in God and believed in what uh, Jesus had done for me, mm. my life at that point certainly didn't kind of reflect that. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I can understand that. Yeah. From personal experience as well. Um, so I guess uh, you're, you're obviously like, you're really involved in church now and you're living for living for God and trying your best to, to do that. So what, at what point did, did Jesus enter the picture again? At what point did you decide that actually life you were going to live for him as your, as your number one, was there a particular point or was it a period of time? Like how did that look? Um, when my wife and I started going out, mm. um, I I could see that she was far more committed to her faith uh, than I was, mm. and I realised in that that you know if our relationship was to progress, my faith needed to be a, the number one priority in my life. Mm. So it's really through that that kind of helped me turn from the direction I was going. I was probably going further and further away from God. Mm. in was living my life but at that point that's where I realized that I needed to you know make much more of an effort myself to live out what I believed and Mm. my faith and um kind of the main priority uh, in Mm. my life and you know live for God rather than living for myself which that's really what I was doing I Mm. believed in God I was really living for myself whereas you know, at that point, I really realized that I need to, to live out what I believe and make that a number one priority. Mm. It, I guess it's, it's cool that God used that circumstance to bring you back to, to having him as the priority. So it's like having a relationship with, with your now wife, Ollie, and realizing that it was her priority. That's, that's the, the means through which you're brought back. I think that's, that's awesome. Yeah, that's cool. Mm. So, I mean, we all know if, if you're a Christian, you know that the life is not straightforward by any means when, when you're living for, for Christ. In, in some ways, you are, you are asking for, um, for a trickier life, trying to, trying to do those things. Um, and we're aware as a church at the moment, you're aware, I'm sure, that like, the coronavirus is, is making things pretty, it's making a pretty anxious time of everything. Um, yeah. And that doesn't negate Christians being anxious and Christians being worried as well. But I suppose, could you give us a little bit of an idea as to how perhaps um, in this time in particular, but also the, like the last 12 months and perhaps even in your life generally, how, is, how has knowing Jesus really made a, a difference uh, to you? I think knowing deep down whatever kind of whatever's happening in my life whatever the the circumstance i always know deep down that i'm loved by god um that one day i'll be with god forever and whatever situation i find myself in i'm not alone in that situation god is with me whether that's a time of of great joy and celebration and you know life's going fairly well or whether that's a, a difficult time in life and things aren't going well or you're you're completely blindsided by something some kind of tragic event or difficult circumstance um that comes your way um you know life as a christian 
isn't going to be, and it's not promised to be a bed of roses. Um, we're um, exposed to all the same kind of things that, that non-Christians are, but we know we can face them uh, with God and we're not on our own. So that's mm -hmm. kind of a real comfort for me, um, especially when, you know, things are difficult and, and things aren't going perhaps as, as smoothly as you'd uh, hoped. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Yeah, I, I'm sure you won't be surprised to know that I, I agree with that ardently. That's that's really encouraging. Um, w one question I, I suppose I, I, I also have is um, being someone who um, grew up in a church and kind of went away from God and then came back to God, that, that period in your life when you, you said you were living for yourself, um, I'm just thinking that there are probably so many people that's true of. Um, we know that there are loads of kids that are involved in church, potentially make um, professions of faith and then go away and live life the way they want to. Um, I suppose if, if there were people like that watching this video, what would be like your one thing that you would say to them potentially? What, what would you encourage them to do when they're living their life thinking they, they really don't need God? I think perhaps kind of really look at what you believe Christ has done for you and then truly examine in yourself what you, how you want to respond to that. Is, is the right response to go out and live how you want or in view of what Christ has done for you, in view of what you believe Christ has done for you, should you be living differently, you know? Mm -hmm. the bible pray live your life how how god how god wants you to because that's you know god's got your best interests at heart um we so often think that we know better than god and you know we don't want to be bothered with what god has to say and how god wants us to live our lives but at the end of the day god created us and he knows what's best for us and he wants what's best for us so you know really look at if you, if you profess you believe in, in God and you believe that Jesus died to save you, in view of the sacrifice that, that Christ made, uh, is it worth you making an effort to live for God or are you content to live, live for yourself? Yeah, yeah, I feel like it, there's a difference between, and often I think when you're very young, you don't quite understand the nuance, which is Jesus dies for you, you respond like everything, everything's okay with that. But actually you, you look at the act of Jesus on the cross and you look at his resurrection and it's taking that one step further and, and actually being amazed and overwhelmed and, and deeply, uh, profoundly affected that God would, God would do that for you. Mm. Um, and it, I guess it's hard not to, as you said, it's hard not to respond with, whoa, he gave everything for me. So why would I not give everything for, for the God that does have my best interests at heart and, and does love me? You just try and do that on a daily basis. It's mm. easy to, you know, drift if you're not thinking about those things and being aware of that. If, you, you know, if it's constantly at the forefront of your mind and you're thinking of those things and you're in close relationship with God, it's you know, a lot easier to stay on track than if you're just drifting and, and mm. really not any attention to God or listening to what he has to say to you. Mm. And so just one last question, Richard, and uh, really it's, do you have a, uh, or what is your favorite Bible verse or, um, or passage of scripture at the moment? Um, so I'd say my, my favorite kind of uh, verses in, in the Bible um, are Romans um, eight verses one and two. Mm -hmm. um, so therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. That's kind of my favorite um, two verses in the Bible. And kind of at the moment with the situation that we're facing and mm. um, uh, stuff like that, I think um, two verses that are really kind of important for us to, to be aware of and, and grasp mm right now are found in Philippians um, 4 and it's verses uh, 6 and 7 and that says uh, do not be anxious about anything but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving 
present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Mm. I just think that's something we can really take comfort in uh, at the moment. Yeah, I, I think that's crucial as well. I was reading that the other day, and um, that is very much a passage that we we kind of throw around, but knowing that, not that you've just done that, but like when we know that um, you exchange your worries and, and take your worries to God in prayer, mm. and then he exchanges that for this peace that actually in and of itself does not make sense to humans, um, which is just incredible. So we know exactly what we need to do as Christians, I suppose, in times, in times like these on a personal level. Yeah. Mm. Thanks very much for, for talking to us. And I think myself and the church included will be, and everyone watching this video will just find it really interesting hearing how your experience in particular and how, how God has affected you and, and taken you and, and done, you know, great things and affected your life in such a, a deep way. So thank you for that. No, you're welcome. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the time that we spent together looking at those testimonies and chatting with those people this evening. Uh, I, th I think they all did a very, very good job. It's not easy to, to have a natural conversation when you know you're being filmed. So thank you so much again to everyone that joined me tonight. If you're not a Christian and you happen to have stumbled upon this video, um, then I can I encourage you to, to think a bit more about how this one person, Jesus, could have had such an impact on four individuals' lives. And as a church, we believe that an encounter, a meeting with Jesus, when you understand what he's done for you and you respond to it, will change your life. It will lead you to having a relationship with the God you were created to know. If you want to know more about that, please just get in touch. You can comment below or, or go on our church website and speak to us via uh, those means. But at the very least, if, if you don't want to do that, then read the Gospel of Mark. You can read it online and read about Jesus. Meet him for the first time. And for those regulars, for the Christians that are a part of the church, then I hope you found that encouraging just to know a bit more about those people in particular and how a story uh, like those is just such a wonderful thing to be encouraged by. Thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, we will see you in a week's time when we're starting our new series on the I Am Sayings of Jesus, trying to explore a bit more about who Jesus was and who he is today as well. Thank you.